day, a new lesson at the University of Houston Bauer College of Business. We're about to get started with uh, Lesson in Investing 101. We're going to talk about the four investment strategies that are designed to help you maximize returns and maximize returns and minimize risk or the other way around. So let's get started. Let me jump into the Zoom meeting and let some folks get uh, logged in. I'm going to admit everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I see a camera that's upside down. That's interesting. Oh, no, it's not upside down. It's pointed at the ceiling. Carolyn, how are you? iPhone guest, how are you? Meredith? Good to see everybody. Hey, could you please let me know you can hear me? You can just drop a chat in. I'm good. I'm good. Good to see you. Yes, you can hear me. Okay, great. And I'm assuming you can see my screen, this screen that, uh, can you see my screen moving up and down there? What you see is a little different than what I see. So let's just make sure that you see what, uh, I want to go over this post this article on investing. We're going to jump into investing today. Carolyn, can you see my screen? Do you see me moving that picture up and down there? Can you see that? Yes, great. Okay, cool. Awesome. Let's get started then. Uh, before I start though, today we're going to talk about investing. We have come a long way in this course. Uh, summer school 2023 is quickly vanishing. We had a holiday last week, the 4th of July, so we did not gather uh, and you did not have any homework due last week. It was due today. Um, so we have a couple more assignments that got posted in Canvas today for you to be due next week. And then uh, after that, we have the capstone assignment. So we're going to be moving quickly through the end of the semester. And I want to make sure that I answer any questions you have and make sure you're keeping up and earning every point you can possibly earn towards that magical 950 points. So before I move on, I want to invite you, whether you're watching uh, live on Facebook or YouTube or watching later on Facebook or YouTube or in our YouTube playlist, I want to invite you now to take a minute and look in your canvas and just see how many points you have uh, for this course right now. Again, the magic number is 950 points, and I want to make sure you get all 950 points uh, that are available. So the capstone assignment is worth 200 points. Every assignment you've done up until now will be a part of your capstone assignment. So all the work you've been doing in your financial plan, uh, all of those assignments will accumulate uh, in your capstone assignment. So basically you will be creating one report that highlights certain things in each of those assignments. So for example, your credit crush assignment where you apply different credit strategies to pay off your imaginary debt, the debt that I asked you to build into your plan with your credit card of at least $10,000, your car purchase, your dream car, whatever you wanted to, to buy, that Tesla, whatever it was, you set that up in your financial plan, you did that assignment, and then your home, your mortgage, those three things. And then in your financial plan, you had to apply certain debt strategies to pay off that debt. And you got a grade on that and you received some feedback, maybe, maybe not. But it, this capstone assignment gives you an opportunity, for example, in the credit crush assignment to go back and review it. Because even though you may have gotten all of your points in that assignment, that doesn't mean that you didn't have something that was missing or deficient for your capstone. So the capstone is like the final exam and I want to make sure you know how it will be graded. So it will be graded the same but here's the thing in summer school I gave you a lot of flexibility. In other words sometimes uh, you missed a few things in certain assignments and I didn't grade them that hard uh, because it's just 
it's a lot of work to give you feedback. The timing in this course in summer, it's pretty tight, and we're doing two assignments a week. So basically, you may have gotten kind of a, a, a good grade, but you still may be missing something. So when you get ready to do your capstone assignment, I don't want to create anxiety about the capstone. It's really pretty easy. And if you're currently in a good place, if you've gotten full points all along, if you've turned in assignments early and received 60 points on those assignments, then you're in really good shape. Uh, and you will be in really good shape when it comes to your capstone assignment. And you will be in really good shape when it comes to the 200 points that you will be receiving for your class participation. So that's four hundred points that theoretically you could add to your number of points right now and then you would know how many points do you need to get an A in the course. So I want you to do that. I want you to take a minute, go look at your points and just do a little mental math and consider 200 points, 200 points for your capstone another 200 points for your class participation and just come up and then you know the number okay so if if you add all those up now if you're missing assignments you're going you're going to have deductions you're also going to have deductions on your class participation so if you have assignments that you didn't bother to do it's too late to do those assignments now you will have received a zero for the assignment and you will get another deduction I think it's 20 points for each of the assignments you missed. So that's all in the syllabus, and it's a little late to try to fix that. So hopefully, I know about 75% of you are well on your way to getting an A. You're doing great. Uh, there are some of you that I know you're working, and you're busy, and you're not really keeping up, and it's a difficult thing. I don't know when the last day is to drop this course and retake it in the fall, but that's certainly something I've been recommending all along for students who are just too busy to keep up with summer school. Summer school is hard. It's just compressed. And so it's hard for me, too. I work full time as well. Uh, so anyway, I hope that helps. I want to give you kind of a, an opportunity to do a checkpoint and look at your points. If you want to uh, visit with me, ask questions, leave a comment. Uh, send an email. If there's something that you need, uh, I want to help. Um, but if it's just a matter of not doing assignments that are missing, the answer is, I'm sorry, that's just not something I'm going to negotiate at this point. Uh, so if you're Hopefully, again, most of you are doing great. Those of you who are showing up for the Zoom meeting uh, and those of you who are watching the Zoom meeting every week, you guys are doing great. But there are some students who haven't even watched the Zoom meetings and they're behind. And, and I, I have these students every semester and they're not here. They're not listening. They're not watching. So I'm not really able to talk to them. I'm talking to you and it's like preaching to the choir have you ever heard that preaching to the choir it's like the choir shows up every week and they get the sermon and all the people that need the sermon don't show up so anyway sorry about that hopefully that's helpful now we're going to jump into investing today and i am going to try to keep my eye on the chat because if you have uh if you have a question or if there's something you need, this time is for you. It's now 10, 12 a.m., and I'm going to jump into the lesson. And I really want to, uh, there's, there's lots of content in your online learning portal at Money Study Group. There's uh, really just the assignment gets posted in Canvas, but the learning content that you really need to pay attention to is in Money Study Group, as you know. Uh, so what I want to do is encourage you this week, this in this lesson in particular on investing, if you want to learn uh, how to invest, this is a great, the next few lessons, the next couple of lessons are really designed to help you feel confident in knowing how to invest. But there is some homework there are some things that you need to learn in order for you to benefit from the lesson that I really want to teach today. 
And so because it's summer school and everything is so compressed, and I know you've been busy with other classes and other assignments in this course, and I know that you, my, I assume, I should say, I assume that you haven't spent a lot of time, most of you, um, reading about investing. Now, listen, it's, it's really simple stuff, but it does require a little time on task for you to understand. So I'm going to go through today's. I, I posted a pretty long article for you, uh, and it's Investing 101. And so I'm just going to scroll down, and you're going to see that I basically highlight four investment strategies that are designed to help you maximize uh, returns and minimize risk. And that's really what investment management is all about. Minimizing risk and maximizing your opportunity for returns or for growth in your portfolio. So if you are willing to learn the things that I point out for you to learn in this lesson, in this lecture, I promise you, you will be well on your way to becoming an effective investment manager for your own investments. Now, a lot of people hire someone like me to manage their investments. And believe me, I'm happy that they do. Uh, I know like my wife would not want to learn the things that I'm asking you to learn in this course. She does not want to be involved in managing investments. So she would be happy to hire a guy like me and pay me to manage her investments. And when you know, typically, I don't know if you know this, but typically dudes die long before women. And my wife's a woman and I'm a man. And I know in my family and in my in my experience, what happens is typically the man dies well before the woman. Women live longer than men. So at some point, my wife's going to be faced with this challenge where she's going to be like, uh, faced with the reality that she's either going to have to learn how to manage her own investments or she's going to have to have someone like me and I'm not around anymore to do it for her. So you have to make the same choice for yourself. And I would encourage you to think about the value, the benefits over your lifetime to learn the basics of investing. And I can't, I just don't have time to spend to teach you everything I'd love to teach you about investing. So I hope we can stay connected over the years and you can continue to learn. I'll share resources with you if you follow me on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube. Uh, I have a new YouTube channel. If you subscribe to that even after the semester, I'll be posting lots of helpful stuff, including other resources that you can use to learn the basics of investing. But just know that it's going to take time, effort, and some focus on your point if you want to learn that. Investing is like the number one most popular topic in this course. And I would love to tell you that I can teach you. Actually, I will tell you. I can teach you how to become a great investor. I can teach you how to maximize your returns and minimize your risk. I can teach you that, but I can't promise that you will learn it because it will take time. So start by reading the stuff that I put, the articles that are in Money Study Group. Read those and just try to understand, starting with these four investment strategies. Number one is diversification. Number two is asset allocation. Number three is dollar cost averaging. And number four is portfolio rebalancing. So again, there is a link to this post, as always, when you watch this video, uh, and when you watch this video uh, on YouTube in the notes section, there are comment section. No, in the notes, there's a link to this post. Now, it's also in Money Study Group. It's also at missionalmoney.com. If you go there and just search for Investing 101, you will find this article. So it's easy to find. If you want to go back, you, you can take notes, but you don't really need to because I've taken lots of notes for you. And so let me get started. I'm going to scroll all the way down to the bottom of this because I added... You can see there's lots of nice pictures to keep your attention and make it interesting. Uh, it's a long article, but it is definitely something you're going to want to read because 
if you want to understand these four investment strategies, this article just kind of unpacks them. And they really will become a great foundation for you. So I'm scrolling all the way down past all of the four investment strategies. And you can see there, um, there's podcast. This isn't, this probably won't be on the podcast. Um, not today anyway. So I'm going to scroll down to the perfect investment. I included this because we haven't talked we haven't talked about the perfect investment yet this semester. Usually by this point, um, when we have a little more time in a regular semester, I try to introduce introduce the perfect investment um, before now, and I like to at least three times during the semester talk about and reiterate and make sure that you understand uh, how the perfect investment works. So spend a few minutes with me now, and I'm just going to unpack a little bit about the perfect investment. Now, as a fiduciary, as someone who is in a business that has a lot of compliance, I got to tell you that there is no such thing as a perfect investment. It would be kind of wrong for me to say, hey, this is the perfect investment, which is exactly what I'm saying. This is the perfect investment because it's not really an investment. A 401k is really a type of account. So I want you to think about that for a second. Most of you, most people that I know, most of the clients that I have and friends and family, when I say something like 401k or Roth IRA or just plain IRA account or rollover IRA or um, there's a number of types of accounts that are familiar to a lot of people. If you have one of those types of accounts, then you're going to be familiar with it to the extent that at least you know that you have that type of account, like a 401k. If you work for a company that offers a 401k plan, then you have one, probably, hopefully. But I want to make the distinction that a type of account is very different than an investment, okay? Uh, the perfect investment that I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes is really a type of account. It's a 401k account. And the reason it's called 401k is because that's where it shows up in the IRS code. The 401k is the paragraph number for that particular qualified retirement plan. So it's a tax qualified plan, which means the IRS, the tax code, gives it special treatment. And that's true about several different types of accounts. And these are very special types of accounts that you need to know about. So I have a new client this week. Uh, I just started the onboarding process. She is an attorney, very successful, um, very sharp. Um, and she took this course a while back, and now uh, she has started to accumulate a good deal of money and needs some help. So we're working on getting her set up. And yesterday, as we had this conversation, it's like the whole idea, the perfect investment, the idea of types of accounts, we had to start from scratch. And I get it. She's she's an attorney. She's gone on from undergrad to law school, and it's just been uh, a whirlwind of learning and opportunities. And so what you learn in this class, I know you're going to forget, and you're going to forget this perfect investment probably as well. But I want you to remember the perfect investment. If I had one like outcome or maybe two outcomes from this course, one would be that every single one of you creates an emergency fund and you fund, you put money in that emergency fund. So that's one of the things that I think this week I'm just going to announce during this Zoom session, that if you want to use that answer this question for your class collaboration, I would love to see it. And that is, have you committed to either start or build an emergency fund as a result of this course, as a result of learning about personal finance and preparing to take responsibility for your financial life? 
have you done anything in terms of your emergency fund? And if you have, and if that's something you're like, yeah, that's something I needed and I'm doing it, I would love to hear about that. If you post that in a comment on YouTube or Facebook or in Money Study Group and just grab the screenshot, you can count that as your class collaboration. And I'd be thrilled to see that. I would be thrilled to know that you're actually doing something differently in your life as a result of what you're learning in this course. I know you want to get an A in the course, and I want you to get an A in the course. But there's really some important little things you can do that can make a big difference in your financial life. So the emergency fund is one of those. The perfect investment is another one of those. And so my hope is that when you graduate and you get that dream job, when you finish this course, you'll be fully prepared to take advantage of the perfect investment. As a financial planner, as someone who's been giving financial advice to people for a long time, I can tell you it never ceases to amaze me how many people fail to take advantage of the opportunity of their 401k plan and the benefits that I'm about to share with you. So I'm hoping that you will listen and pay attention and understand that you can be prepared on day one to take advantage of the perfect investment. So if you work for a company, if that dream job that you put down in your financial plan and you know that you're assuming or hoping that you get when you graduate, if that company offers a 401k plan, I want you to know how it works. So here the basics are. I call it the perfect investment because it's a great deal. Your company Often, the company 401k plan often includes a company match. So let's pretend that the company is, let's say Shell. At one time, Shell Oil Company had, I want to say it was an 8% match. And they would match 8%. So what does that mean? Uh, you can read all about it. I posted it here, but I want to just kind of tell you the story about the perfect investment and how it works. So let's assume you work for Shell and they have an 8% uh, match. So let's just pretend that you make $100,000 a year. If you make $100,000 a year and the company gives you an 8% match, there's something you have to do to receive that benefit. So First of all, in the chat, someone tell me what is 8% of $100,000? And I keep these numbers very simple so that they will be very simple so that you can tell me what's 8% of $100,000. I will watch and wait to see that in the chat. Let's see if I can find the chat. I don't see anybody chatting. Yes, thank you, Carolyn. It's $8,000. So... I'm going to try to open my chat. Hmm. Okay, yep, it's eight grand. Thank you, Meredith, Carolyn. Uh, so $8,000 is 8% of $100,000. So what do you think you have to do to get your company, if you happen to be working for Shell, making $100,000 a year, and they're offering you an 8% match, what do you have to do to receive that $8,000? What do you have to do? to take advantage of this perfect investment. I'm watching. Yes, thank you, Meredith. You got it. It's pretty simple. To get the 8%, the first thing you have to do is you have to know that your company provides or offers an 8% match. And if you're making 100000 that means you have to contribute $8,000 to your company 401k plan. It's it's that simple to get started. So in this case, it's eight grand. So what does that mean? Eight grand a year you have to put into your 401k, which is a type of account. It's not an investment. We haven't talked about investing anything. It's just money that you put into the account. And if you put in eight grand, uh, then what will they do? You already know the answer. But tell me just so we can make sure everybody sees it and knows. So you've got a 401k, you work for, let's say, Shell, and they have an 8% uh, 
uh, matching feature and you have to put in 8%, which is eight grand. So you take $8,000 out of your paycheck every week or every other week, however often you get paid, and you just have that deducted from your paycheck and it goes into magically into your 401k account. And then the company matches what you put in. So at the end of the year, how much, Meredith, do you have in your 401k account? Yes. Thank you, Carolyn. Yep. Meredith, thank you, guys. It's $16,000. Now, if you reviewed Dave Ramsey's seven baby steps, they're pretty helpful. They're very simple, but they're pretty helpful. The last one, I th maybe the second to last one, number six, I believe, is to contribute 15% of your income to a long-term retirement plan. That's one of the baby steps. So if you want to learn Dave Ramsey's seven baby steps, they're in Money Study Group. They're a helpful kind of template for financial planning. If you just took away one thing from this course and you learned and actually did those baby steps, you'd be in good shape. One of them is the emergency fund. And one of them is basically this perfect investment although he doesn't talk about the perfect investment. He just says, save 15% for retirement. And what I want to highlight, what I want to put into context for you, because most of you, when you see that number, most people, when they see that number, 15% of my income, take that and save it? How do I do? That seems really hard. But you just saw with the perfect investment, you achieve that goal really simply by putting $8,000 into your 401k and then the company matches it and you've already saved 16% of your income. So it's one of the kind of, I think of it as a shortcut. Like I always want to put a finger on the scale or take a, whatever. Maybe it's cheating. Maybe that's not quite going to cut it for Dave Ramsey. But what I want you to think about is at the end of the day, your savings plan for retirement is pretty significant because of this one perfect investment. So I hope that helps. But there's more. So does anybody else, does anybody know what else we might consider a huge benefit that would make this the perfect investment? Your 401k with a company match where you are contributing money directly from your paycheck into this account, this special type of account called a 401k. Anybody know what another benefit might be? Uh, Carolyn, you say tax free at retirement. So think about that for a minute. Tax free at retirement. It's not actually tax free at retirement. Now, there is a tax free at retirement type of account, and you're going to learn about that type of account next week. It's called a Roth IRA. That's where you put your money into that type of account and you don't get a tax deduction. And then when you take the money out, it's tax free because you've already paid tax on it. It grew over the years if you did it right. And then you take the money out and you pay no taxes. But in this case, we're talking about a 401k plan, which is actually, yes, iPhone user. I don't know who that is. It just says iPhone because you didn't put your name in. So I don't know who you are to give you credit. I'll just say iPhone. iPhone, Mr. Mrs. iPhone. Tax deferred is different than tax free. So what iPhone, what does tax deferred mean? What happens with tax deferred? And that's really not even the answer to the question. We're now making the distinction about this type of account as not tax free, but tax deferred, which means what? What does that mean, tax deferred? We pay tax with, with, when withdrawn. Perfect. That's exactly right. When you withdraw the money, then you pay tax. That's what tax deferred means. So in a 401k and most of these tax qualified retirement types of accounts, you get to take the money out when you turn a certain age and that age is 69 and a half. And when you take out money at that age, I'm almost that age. I'm not quite that age. No, 59 and a half, not 69, 59 and a half. And unfortunately, 
I am that age. So I can take money out of my 401k at 59 and a half. I'm actually 61, so I could have been doing this for some time. I can take money out of my 401k or my IRA or whatever tax qualified, tax deferred type of account I own. I can take money out and I don't have to pay a penalty. That's what tax deferred is. But that's not really the answer to the question. My question was, what's the big benefit? Yes, being tax deferred is a benefit, but there's another benefit that's more immediate and more helpful, and it shows up more like every year that you do this. This benefit is it starts with tax, and it's got a D in it, but it's not, uh, it's not deferred. Uh, it's tax D. Anybody want to fill in the blank there? Tax D. I was born on April 15th. I'm going to try to help you understand the benefit of this next big benefit. The benefit of this next big, help you understand this next big benefit. So I was born on April 15th. My first son was born, my first child, my son, was born on December 31st at like 11.30 p.m., so just a few minutes before midnight, which would have meant that he would have been born next year. So I got to take a tax deduction. When I was in college, I got married, had my first son. And at that time, I want to say it was a $1,250 credit, which is like a tax deduction on steroids. It's a, it's, it's a tax credit which is like a tax deduction. Basically, not only do you not pay tax, but in a tax credit, you actually get money from the government. Um, so tax, the thing about a 401k or any tax deferred type of account is when you put money into it, you get a benefit from the IRS. It's called a tax deduction. That's what I got with my son who was born the last day of the year. I got to have a deduction for the entire year, even though he was born the last day of the year. So I like tax deductions. They're great. And when you put money into your 401k, that's one of the big benefits. It's one of the things that makes it the perfect investment. So that's you get the company match and you get a tax deduction. So if that's true, then what does that mean? If you make a hundred grand and you put eight grand into your 401k, how much do you pay tax on? What amount of money are you responsible at the end of that year to pay the IRS for your income? I'll wait. Yeah, Carolyn, that's pretty simple, right? Now, if you do the math, which your financial plan will help you do if you want to check this out, if you're making $100,000 a year and you're funding your 401k, you can see what your tax liability is going to be and how much it goes down. And I promise you it makes a difference. And over time, it's like a compound growth uh, situation. Not only are you getting the money growing in your 401k plan, because you're adding $8,000 to it every year. And when you get a raise, if you keep contributing 8%, and now you're making, let's say, $150,000, grand, now it's $12,000 you're contributing, and your company's matching that, and you're getting a tax deduction, all of these things kind of pile up and help you build wealth. So I could teach you all about the inside baseball of investing. I know a ton about investing, but I'm telling you the perfect investment is the number one thing you need to learn uh, about investing, about building wealth, before you learn all the other minutia that I want to teach you. And I do want to teach you. I want to teach you these four investment strategies that are designed to help you maximize your returns and minimize risk. Because if you learn those four investment strategies, you can take those four investment strategies and you can apply them inside of your 401k plan. But first, you have to make sure that you're taking advantage of the perfect investment, which means putting money into that type of account 
long before you ever decide what you're going to actually do as far as investments go. Because a type of account doesn't have anything to do, well, it's not the same as investing. Once we get the money in the account, then we have to make a decision, how are we going to invest it? So I want you to understand the distinction between a type of account and an investment. Just know that there's a world of difference. And the type of account matters because that's what makes it the perfect investment in this case. Which means I want you to know on day one, when you sign up, uh, when you go to work, on day one, you're going to meet with HR, human resources. They're going to do orientation. They're going to tell you all about the benefits that you get in that job. One of the benefits, hopefully, will be your 401k plan. And they'll sit down with you and they'll give you a form and they'll say, do you want to participate in your 401k plan? And your answer will be, yes, I do. And the next question will be, how much do you want to contribute to your 401k plan? And your answer will be, hmm, what is the company match? And whatever that company match is, you don't have to think about it. You at least want to contribute the amount of the company match. So again, if you're working at Shell, pretend you make 100 grand, they're paying eight, they, they have an 8% match. You do some quick math and you go, okay, what's that divided by? How many times do I get paid? Let's say you get paid 24 times a year. You take $8,000, divide it by 24, and that's how much you have subtracted or removed from your paycheck and contributed to your 401k. It's super simple math. And you need to be ready to make those decisions on day one. And once you've done that, the next question is going to be, okay, if you're going to put that much money into your 401k, whatever amount of money you want to put into your 401k, how do you want to invest it? And that is where these investment strategies come in. And so I'm going to teach you now these four investment strategies that you can apply inside of your 401k and anywhere else you're investing. So I hope that helps to set the table because if I were in your shoes, I wish someone would have told me that the perfect investment, one way I can really start to build wealth for myself, for my future, especially and specifically for retirement, and retirement may seem like forever, forever away from you, but I think of retirement as simply financial independence, having enough wealth built so that I don't have to go to work for someone else or even myself. Like, I don't have to work. I like to work. I don't ever want to retire. As long as I can work, I enjoy working. It feels good to work. Uh, and so, but I didn't really enjoy working for Morgan Stanley on Wall Street. It was a great company. Uh, I worked with some really nice people, um, but it was a sales job. And I didn't enjoy having the pressure of always having to get new clients all the time. No matter what it took, if I wanted to keep my job, I had to sell. Same as when I was a state farm agent. The company wanted me to be selling insurance all the time. So, I mean, that's why I'm independent now. And to me, independence is like the ultimate goal. It, when it comes to finance, finances, like why do you save your money? Why do you invest your money? Why do you work hard to be a good steward with your money? What matters most to you? And I don't know the answer to that for you, but you need to think about that. And so I'm trying to teach you some things you can do for long-term success. And this perfect investment is one way you can really move the needle on your life in terms of financial independence. And at some point in your life, you're not going to want to have to work for that company. Even though they may be a great company with great people, there's going to come a time in your life where you're going to want to do it because you choose to do it, not because you have to do it. 
and that's financial independence. It doesn't mean you quit working or leave the company, but there may come something, something may happen in your life where you go, you know what, I want to go live on another continent and do something that's totally not because I have to make an income. That's, that's, anyway, the perfect investment. I hope you are picking up what I'm putting down. I hope that when you start that job, you're ready to take advantage of the perfect investment. Now let's just talk through these four investment strategies. And again, you have all this content, but I want to just highlight them. And as we go, I want to answer any questions you have. Uh, so first is diversification. It's the simplest, most basic investment strategy. I like to use this picture of uh, picture of an elevator. So I had a kind of a mentor early on when I became an investment advisor. He was with Edward Jones. His name was his name was David Coney. We used to sit around. He called it his fireside chat. And he was great at telling stories. So he had a story to illustrate everything. And this is a story he taught me about the elevator. So the elevator, basically on one side, you see that elevator has many cables. And that kind of represents, to David, it represented a mutual fund. And if you ever invest in a mutual fund, that is an investment. It's a type of investment. And a mutual fund has a manager. So you pay a fee to buy a mutual fund, and the, you, part of the fee is for the manager to go and pick and select individual companies that are inside of that mutual fund. And so his job, the, or her job, the mutual fund manager, they're always looking at each of those companies, each of those cables. And if one of them starts to have some problems in their balance sheet or their business model or their management, uh, whatever, then the manager will take that company out of the mutual fund and maybe replace it with another better, stronger company. And that's what those cables represent. And a mutual fund is a good example of diversification because you're not putting all of your eggs in one basket. On the other side is an elevator with one cable. And that represents not being diversified. I always tell the story about Enron. If you don't know the story about Enron, you should do a little research. I have some stories post, I think, a couple videos about Enron and my experience with Enron with a couple of different clients. One of them was Andrea. She was a middle manager and she was diversified. Like she didn't follow the Enron uh, leaders, those corrupt, greedy, evil leaders who told all the folks at Enron when they were collapsing that there's never been a better time to put more money into your 401k and buy Enron stock. So when you work for a company, you have the option of buying your company stock in your 401k. And that's what Enron was pushing. They wanted everyone who worked for the company to buy more Enron stock. They wanted to the whole world to buy more Enron stock because it was collapsing, because they were cooking the books, because they were they were not legitimate. They were showing earnings that were fake, that were cooked. The books were cooked. Anyway, I worked with this one lady who was a middle manager, and she was not putting her money in Enron stock. She still had a 401k at Enron. She made really good money but she diversified. She did not put all of her money in Enron stock. And she did really well. Even after Enron collapsed, she got another job. I helped her manage her investments. She did really great. But then on the other hand, there was Bill. Bill was a, he was an upper manager. He had over a million dollars in his 401k. It was all in Enron stock. Now, Bill was like 60 years old when Enron started to collapse, and he put everything he had into Enron stock. And he, when they collapsed, the stress was so great. He had a heart attack. He died, and I worked with his widow. And she had nothing because Bill didn't diversify. He had everything in Enron stock. So that's the story I tell. That one cable represents Enron. When that cable breaks, if your investments are not diversified, you're going to lose everything or a lot. And so 
the first strategy I want you to understand is the simplest of all, diversification. It's a risk management strategy that you need to understand. Now, there's another one, uh, and you can, again, I would read the summary, just absorb what it means, because if you learn these four investment strategies that are designed to help you maximize returns and minimize risk, if you learn them, you'll be well on your way to becoming a really good investor. These four strategies will help you manage that 401k with confidence and with really good results. I promise you this will make a difference in your financial life if you learn these four strategies so the next one is asset allocation and i'll just tell you asset allocation is the number one most uh, important investment strategy that's that will it it's the number one determinant okay asset allocation is the number one determinant determining factor of how your portfolio will perform. So diversification is really important, but like the next step, it's a similar kind of thing, but it's more strategic. Asset allocation means you need to understand the difference between different asset classes. And I don't have the time to teach that to you today. But if I did, I would tell you, you need to know the difference between a small cap stock so when I say small cap, that just means a small company versus a large cap. That means a large company. So what's a large company? McDonald's, Coca-Cola, U.S. Steel. What's a small company? Bayrock Financial, my company, very small. There's a whole bunch of small companies. And the difference is if you're going to invest in one, either a large cap or a small cap, which one has more risk? which one has more opportunity? If you invest in Apple when it was just getting started, or Amazon when it was just getting started, or Tesla when it was just getting started, now those are all big companies, but if you would have invested in them when they were small, your opportunity, but over time you would see that chart go up and down. So the risk, the volatility in a small company is greater than a large company. And that's how you need to think about those two distinctions, large cap, small cap. If you were going to have four asset classes in your portfolio, in your 401k, those are two right there. Large cap, think of S&P 500. The S&P 500 is uh, the standard in poor's 500. They're the 500 largest U.S. companies. That's the S&P 500. That would be large cap. Small cap, you could say the Russell 2000. 2000 uh, of the largest small companies in the United States. So those are two asset classes you need to understand. If you want to understand asset allocation, it's all about asset classes. Another asset class you should understand would be like international. That would be companies that are in other parts of the world besides the United States. That's another asset class. A different asset class would be bonds. And I don't have the time to teach you the difference between a bond and an equity, but you should take the initiative to learn that. If you want to become an effective investor, you'll want to learn more about asset classes. It's a huge, important part of investing. But if you just want to be simple, and, and it's okay to be simple. Simple works really well when it comes to investing. In fact, Warren Buffett, the be, he's well known to be the most, the, the most fantastic investor ever. I like what he has some great quotes. He's an old man that lives in Nebraska. He's old now. He's older than me quite a bit. Anyway, he says that investing doesn't have to be, oh, how, how does he say it? Investing isn't like Olympic diving. You don't get extra points for difficulty. Okay, so if you're an Olympic diver, you get extra points for how difficult. You <laughs> but in investing, it's like the opposite. You can keep everything very simple, but you, you want to know four asset classes because when you do your 401k and set it up, you're going to have to pick. And you could pick the four that I just mentioned. Small cap, large cap, international and bonds, U.S. bonds. That's four that would give you great 
asset allocation. It would work just fine for you. And now we get to the next investment strategy, which is called dollar cost averaging. And, I'll, and so I'm, I'm scrolling through a lot of information because we don't have that much time left. But just remember asset allocation, it's the number one determinant of your portfolio's returns. My favorite investment strategy is dollar cost averaging. Dollar cost averaging, you'll want to read the summary for dollar cost averaging, but I'm going to tell you a quick story, uh, and then I'm going to have to tell it quick if we're going to get it in time, or I'll keep you late. Uh, so dollar cost averaging, hold on, I've got... <clears throat> Uh, sorry about that. I've got somebody trying to join the course, and it's like really late, so I don't let you join after five minutes or so. Dollar cost averaging is is uh, it's a it's my favorite strategy. It's the most powerful, I think, the most powerful strategy for building wealth that can help you maximize returns and minimize. Uh, risk, especially for younger folks who have a long time to invest. So for most of you, this strategy is one I want you to understand. So I'm going to just tell you a story about Farmer Joe. He's a farmer and he wanted to, he's, I was his advisor and he wanted to uh, expand his investment horizon. So he didn't have any cows he wanted to invest in cows because there's a lot of things you can do with cows. You can do the beef, there's milk, there's leather, you know. So anyway, he wanted to invest in cows. So we got started using dollar cost averaging. The way it worked for Joe is he was going to invest 100 bucks a month systematically to invest in cows. This is dollar cost averaging. So the first month he invests his hundred bucks and cows happen to be 20 bucks a head. So how many cows does Joe get to buy that month? Think about it. He's investing a hundred bucks and let's pretend this is an asset class. It's not a chicken. It's not a pig. It's a cow, uh, but it could be a large cap, small cap, could be a bond, could be whatever investment you want it to be. But in this case, it's cows and they're, he's investing a hundred bucks a month. Like it could be his 401k account, but it's his cow account. And he's putting a hundred bucks a month towards that. And then however many cows he can buy each month, according to that hundred bucks, he gets to buy that many cows. And this month cows are 20 bucks a head. So he puts his hundred bucks in. Oh no, cows are a hundred bucks a head. I should pay attention to my notes. So the first month cows are a hundred bucks a head. How many cows does Joe get for a hundred bucks? I'll wait for you to tell me chat I want to make sure you're you're here show chat how can I there we go yep Meredith Caroline Carolyn one it's super simple 100 bucks a month the next month cows drop in half they're 50 bucks a head how many cows can you get the second month two thank you very much and then the next month cows go to 25 bucks a head and you guessed it four cows. Thank you very much. And then finally, the, not finally, but the fifth month, cows drop all the way to 20 bucks a head. And I'm looking at the screen to see who's going to be first. Yes, Carolyn, you win five cows. You get it, right? A hundred bucks a month. That's a systematic investment. The price of cows go up and down. The more cows cost, the less number of cows you're going to buy with your hundred bucks, the lower cows go, the more cows you're going to be able to buy. And at this point, I'm fast. Huh? <laughs> yes, yeah, she's fast. So here's the thing, though. Joe calls me up when cows drop to 20 bucks a head. And he's like, Jim, what did you get me into? Cows are a disaster. And I'm like, what? Wait a minute, Joe. Let's talk about opportunity, risk, reward. And basically he's telling me like cows started at a hundred bucks a head and I could only buy, you know, I got one cow at a hundred bucks a head. Now they're 20 bucks a head. I want to sell all my cows and get out of cows. I don't want to do cows anymore. I'm like, dude, wait, hold, wait, stop. 
here's where if you're a financial advisor an investment advisor here's where you really get to determine whether or not your clients trust you and i told joe i said look you pay me to give you advice i'm going to give you some advice and i hope you take it because if you take it that's going to be good for our relationship it's going to help you it's going to help me but if you blow me off and just just do what you want to do right now you're going to miss an opportunity so i'm like joe look if i were you I wouldn't stop investing in cows right now. In fact, if I were you right now, I would go sell your old John Deere tractor, the one that you paid $50,000 for 12 years ago, that same tractor that you paid $12,000, $50,000 for 12 years ago, will sell today for $65,000. Now you may say that's crazy, that can't be true. But it is true. Here's why. Because the old John Deere tractors didn't have near as many computerized parts on them. So all the old farmers, they can't find technicians to work on their new tractors. Because of all the technology, they have to have a tech technician. And that means they may have to wait. And that means their harvest may have to wait. It's a disaster because of COVID and because of the new technology and the number of people that are in the field doing the work on those tractors. So the old tractors are like gold. I'm like, dude, sell your old tractor and buy more cows. He didn't want to do that. That's cool. But he took my advice. He kept investing 100 bucks a month. And the next month, cows were back up to 25 bucks a head. How many cows did he get in month number one, two, three, four, month number five. So we've so far we've gone five months and now cows have dropped or gone up rather from 20 bucks ahead to 25. Yes, he got four cows. And then the next month, Meredith and Carolyn, the next month you see cows went back up to 50 bucks a head. And yes, he got two cows. You are fast. Anyway, the next month, you guessed it, cows go all the way back up to their normal price of 100 bucks a head. And this is where we stop and we take a look at dollar cost averaging and we do a little math. Okay, so yeah, he bought one cow because it's 100 bucks a head and that's what he's investing. So at the end of the day, after one month, two months, so the first month they're 100 bucks, and then they're 50, then they're 25, then they're 20, and then they're 25, and then they're 50, and then they're 100 bucks a head. So that's seven months of investing 100 bucks a month, which totals how much did Farmer Joe invest over seven months to buy cows? How much money did he invest? I'm looking. Yes, you got it. You guys are, follow. I love it when you follow. It's so simple math, but this is how dollar cost averaging works. Now, if he did that for seven months and he put 700 bucks into these investments, how many cows did he buy over those seven months? This is the difficult question. You really have to pay attention to get this answer right because you have to look and count the heads of cattle that he bought. 700 is how much he invested. Meredith, are you using your calculator? Are you there? Can you not do the math? Can you not see one cow, three cows, seven cows, and then five more cows, seven, eight, nine, ten. I mean, I'm counting the heads. You guys can count them too. Look at your screen. Can you see them? Can you see the cow heads? How many cows did he buy over seven months? I can't move forward until you answer the question. You've done so well up to now. Please, if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, before I tell you, before we talk, yes, thank you, Meredith, you win a thousand extra points. Just kidding. 19 cows. It's pretty simple, right? Yay, yes, yay. So first of all, if you just count them, you can see that it's 19. But do the math in your head. He started out investing 100 bucks. 
And how many cows was he able to buy? If you understand this story, you will understand dollar cost averaging. And it will be really, really helpful for you to know that over time, your disciplined approach to investing will pay off big time. There's no more powerful strategy than dollar cost averaging. So this isn't just a funny story about Farmer Joe. This is a real deal. It's like a strategy that works. So think about it. If he put 700 bucks in over seven months, $100 a month, and he was able to buy 19 cows for $700, and today, what is the price of a cow? I mean, in this story today, when Joe, after seven months of putting 100 bucks in, cows are now 100 bucks ahead. So here's my question, Meredith and Carolyn, and anyone else who's listening who's not getting extra bonus points because you're not participating, but you're, maybe you are. Maybe you're going to leave your comment in YouTube or Facebook. So if that's true, if he bought, if he invested 700 bucks over seven months, or one, two, three, yeah, seven months, and he was able to buy 19 cows, and cows are trading at 100 bucks a head, now's the time I'm saying to Joe, okay, Joe, you, you, let's maybe think about getting out of cows for a while because they're up to 100 bucks a head. How much money did you make? Joe, we're doing our quarterly review, and I want to say our annual review. And, you know, we're looking at his investment returns, and we're going, Joe, you invested 700 bucks, you bought 19 cows, and you could sell those cows for 100 bucks a head. Nine, yeah, Carolyn and Meredith came up quick with the profit. So you got the 1900 revenue, that's how much he took in, but he invested 700 That means the profit was $1,200. And here's the cool thing. Let's pretend that Farmer Joe was buying cows in his 401k account. And let's say he did sell all of his cows. Now he would basically be sitting there with $1,900 cash after putting only $700 into cows. And he would have got a gain that he didn't even have to pay taxes on until he takes the money out. That's a beautiful, beautiful strategy. So get to know dollar cost averaging. It is the most powerful investment strategy for young people who have a long time to invest. It will take the risk out of investing. And then, excuse me, it'll take the risk out of investing. And when you see the market tank, you can just know, hey, that's good for me. Because this volatility, when the market goes down, I'm going to continue every month to put money into my 401k. And when the market's way down, it may be way down for a year like it was last year or for two years like it was in the 2008 financial crisis. You're going to keep on investing using dollar cost averaging and letting time and volatility in each of these different asset classes. Because remember, you're not going to just be investing in cows. You're going to be doing the same things with chickens and horses and, and goats and pigs. And every one of those different asset classes are going to be doing different things in different times of the market. And that's the beauty of dollar cost averaging. That's the beauty of asset allocation. Finally, I want to cover, whoops, finally, I want to cover quickly portfolio rebound. Do you have any questions about dollar cost averaging? It's literally my favorite investment strategy because it has the potential to help you build wealth more quickly and more directly than any other strategy. I mean, Asset allocation matters, but when you do asset allocation with dollar cost averaging, like in your 401k, it's almost like bulletproof. It's just a great set of strategies. So get to know these strategies, uh, and then we get to portfolio rebalancing, and I'm just going to quickly say, look, if you don't, the name portfolio rebalancing should be pretty self-explanatory. You should read the summary, read about it. But basically what it means is different asset classes go up and down. And every once in a while, like quarterly or twice a year or at least once a year, you should rebalance your portfolio. And what that looks like is 
Imagine you have a circle, a pie, with four quadrants, okay, four quarters. And one of those quarters could be cows, or it could be large cap stocks you pick. But what happens over time is one of those quadrants turns into, it grows, it goes up, up, up. And another one may go down, down, down. So when you rebalance, what you do is you take the profit from this big quadrant that grew way a lot and you sell off your profits and you invest those profits in the one that's down. Like you want to buy low and sell high. And when you rebalance your portfolio, that's what you're doing. You're selling high and buying low and you're doing it on a systematic basis so you don't even have to think about it. You just hit a button. Most 401k plans have, a, you click here to rebalance your portfolio. And by doing that, it's like doing dollar cost averaging across your entire portfolio with one click of a button. That's portfolio rebalancing. Four investment strategies that are designed to help you maximize returns and minimize risk. Diversification, the simplest one. Asset allocation, the number one most important determinant of your portfolio's returns. It's like diversification with a strategic approach. You got to understand the difference between different asset classes and how they go up and down at different times in the market. You don't really need to be an expert. Just know that asset allocation is based on asset classes. That's what makes it work. Number three is dollar cost averaging. The most powerful investment strategy for a younger person who has a long time to invest. It will give you the best bang for your buck. It will help you build wealth. It's, it's just a powerful strategy. It's my favorite, dollar cost averaging. And finally, portfolio rebalancing, which takes all of the other strategies and just kind of with one click, you rebalance your portfolio. And over time, that can make a big difference in the results. So take what you learned about the perfect investment Build on to it with these four investment strategies. Learn a little bit about asset classes and you'll be well on your way to taking advantage of all of the investment strategies you need to know to become an expert in investing. And you start with your 401k because your 401k is the perfect investment. Any questions, comments, funny pictures, you guys have been fun. Meredith and Carolyn, I really appreciate you being with me today and your interaction. Thank you so much. And you too, iPhone, whoever you are. One new message. Uh, I'm glad this was fun. Hopefully it was helpful too. This is really the central way to build wealth is to know these strategies and to put them to work in your 401k. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see y'all later. I'm glad it was helpful. Thank you so much. You guys have a great day. I am going to jump on over to the live stream and I'm going